Political instability, food insecurity and cholera. Multiple crises that continue to slam the small Caribbean nation of Haiti. Hello, I'm Arlen Vlider and this is The Heat. From any angle, it's clear the situation in Haiti is dire. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has multiple times called for international intervention, deployment of an armed force on the ground. In 2022 alone, there were more than 2,000 murders amid widespread gang violence. Nearly half of Haiti's population, 4.7 million people, are suffering from food shortages. And a recent cholera outbreak has swept across the nation as clean water and other basic necessities become scarce. Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry has asked for security assistance and believes the international community will help. I celebrate that the parties reached a national consensus and gave their unanimous support to the request for assistance from a specialized force presented by the government to the international community to accompany the National Police of Haiti in the fight against gangs. Some countries have expressed their desire to participate in this multinational force, and I have good reason to hope that this solidarity will materialize. To discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us here in Washington, D.C., Albert Decady is the former executive director of the United Front of the Haitian Diaspora. From Canada, Stephen Berenier is a professor of international development and global studies at the University of Ottawa. And from New York, Kim Ives is an editor with Haiti Liberté newspaper. And from Ethiopia, we are joined by Monique Kleska who is a journalist and author. Welcome to all of you to the show. Uh, Monique, let me start with you. Haiti just lurches from one crisis to another. We remember very clearly that a hurricane that hit the small island nation devastated the country. It was already in trouble at that time, and it doesn't seem to have improved since then. Uh, now, of course, we have serious problems with violence. Um, law and order has broken down. Gangs are running part of the country. In fact, one report says up to 60% of the country is run by gangs. Other reports say actually it's 100% that's run by gangs. How did Haiti get to this situation now? Well, uh, thank you uh, for having me as a guest. I think Haiti got to this situation because there are two forces that are at play. You have, first of all, the, the international community that has for years and years held a grip on Haiti and directed the way that Haiti should be. And then you have the man-made disasters, Haitian leaders who have catered mostly to the international community and have not respected the human rights of Haitians and have terrorized Haitians. And this is what we have had, certainly, for the last 11 years. Now, you mentioned the, the earthquake, the hurricanes. These are natural disasters that if indeed we have a state that provides services and that plans ahead, then we can at least prepare for them. But we do not have that. And for the last 11 years, we have had a governance system. It came from Martelly, then we had Jovenel Moise, and now with Ariel Henry, who actually work with the gangs, who actually sometimes pay the gangs and are in cahoots with the gangs so that they cannot provide services for the Haitian population, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it is security. So I, we believe that what has to be resolved is we need a different kind of governance. We need different leaders who are involved in providing services, for respecting the human rights. And when I talk about human rights, I'm not only talking about right to expression, right to political activity, but I'm talking about the rights to social services, education. I'm talking about health, about half of the population 
doesn't have access to health care. And I'm talking about the right to live so as not to be terrorized by gangs. So that is how we got to the situation, and that is how we need to move back so that the leadership of the country can be a leadership that looks to its citizens and provides for its citizens, rather than a leadership that rapes, that kills, that steals from its citizens along with the gangs. And I think that is the leadership model, that is the governance model that we are talking about. And this is where we want to go. And if you want more information, we can provide that. Right. And that is where the Montana Accord is leaning towards, and that is what right. we have been fighting for the last two years. Okay, Monique, I want to get to that Montana Accord in just a little while, but I want to get to Albert right now. Albert, uh, of course, the violence, the gang violence, is getting out of control in Haiti right now. It's pretty widespread. The United Nations Special Envoy to Haiti, uh, Helen Lalim, she addressed the impact of gun violence. Let's listen to some of what she had to say. You know the situation in Haiti is grave. You know that gang-driven violence has reached new heights. On average, we, um, we faced one kidnapping every six hours in 2022. You heard me say yesterday that indiscriminate violence led to 2,183 murders in 2022, with presidential candidates, police directors, and the very poorest in society all as victims. So, Albert, as we heard Monique tell us a moment ago, it seems that there are parts of the government uh, that are part of the problem as well, because they are paying these gangs to operate in Haiti. But what has happened to the country's law enforcement, the police forces, the security forces in the country? So, uh, I think the question is to Albert, right? <laughs> I didn't hear you well. So, um... One of the problems in Haiti is that uh, the institutions have been eroded in, in, in a number of years. And so is also the police uh, has been uh, eroded in, 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 in a situation where the, 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 that institution is unable to do, it, to do its job. As uh, uh, Monique uh, uh, mentioned earlier, it's, it's due to a leadership and, and the proper, proper governance. So what is needed right now is uh, the help to actually rebuild the, uh, the police, support the police, provide the police with the, with the means that they need to actually be able to police the, the country. Uh, I do a, a little bit disagree that uh, all of Haiti is, is, in, is in chaos and, 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 and unsafe. The, the, the majority is just in around, around Port-au-Prince and the, the Latibonite region. So it is not the whole country. And, uh, in fact, the, the, the citizen of the country uh, and the countryside seems to be taking care of themselves very well. Um, so what is needed is to, is to control the city, and, and that needs to be done to, a, to our police force with supporting, supporting that police force to be able to do that job with the proper techniques, the proper uh, equipment to be able to—, uh, to, to uh, and, and also, uh, to get to clean the police uh, out of, because uh, some of the police uh, have been mentioned to be involved with gang, uh, with gangs as well. So there's a need for an internal investigation to get rid of the police of the bad apples mm -hmm. in, in, in such a way that you can have a police force that can actually work. There are uh, policemen that are uh, that, that are that, that are dear to their job and they really want to do a good job. They need the support, they need the, the material, the, the, the know-how, and a government that can support them. And we cannot go to a government that can really support them until we actually go to election, uh, which I advocate that we need to go to, go to election. Albert, um, I mean, how much of a challenge is it going to be to restore trust in the police force, to rebuild the police forces and the security forces, really? I mean, are there institutions in Haiti that can do that? 
I, I think that's where the, the international institutions, uh, the international uh, uh, countries can actually help and help build and maybe uh, do some, help them to do some cleanup in the police force themselves. So the international uh, and the UN, um, although hesitant to actually send boots on the ground, uh, have put that on the table to put boots on the ground. Uh, I don't think that's the solution because the, the, we had boots on the ground before and uh, that did not solve the problems. Yeah. Uh, so we need to build the institutions. We need to find the, the, the Haitians that are, uh, that are willing to actually do the hard work to do the adaptive leadership that is needed right. uh, to be able to uh, go above the fray and, and take the balcony and look down and actually solve the problem that needs to be solved yeah. uh, in a systematic way, in a sustainable way. And uh, it, it's going to be a hard work. Yes. It's definitely a hard work, but it's a work that needs to be done. Cannot be, it cannot be outsourced. Okay, Stephen Barani, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, he addressed the CARICOM summit uh, last week. This is what he said. Let's listen. I am announcing that Canada will also deploy Royal Canadian Navy vessels to conduct surveillance, gather intelligence, and maintain a maritime presence off the Haitian coast in the coming weeks. Canada continues to reinforce the capacities of the Haitian police to overpower armed gangs and hold those who support them accountable. Uh, so Stephen, uh, Trudeau also said that Canada will provide $12.3 million in humanitarian assistance and $1.8 million to strengthen border and maritime security. And he's also talking about gathering intelligence, about surveillance. I mean, is that really going to help the violence on the ground? Um, is it really effective? Uh, I mean, we heard that expression just now, boots on the ground. Is it really effective um, if they, there are ships, really, offshore who are trying to help when you actually need people on the ground in Haiti? Right. The ships are uh, uh, an odd choice, I must say, uh, an odd addition to the Canadian assistance package, uh, because although the official... Uh, Canadian government position is that they're there to uh, conduct surveillance, gather intelligence, and uh, indicate to gang leaders and their political backers, as uh, Monique uh, explained, mm -hmm. that uh, business as usual is no longer an option, that uh, a force could be used against them by the international community if uh, they don't uh, actually agree to lay down their arms and to a transitional process. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's, it's odd because, uh, frankly, uh, I think that uh, both the Haitian state, the police, and the Canadian government have um, a lot of the intelligence they actually need to identify where the gang leaders are, uh, what kind of equipment they have, what they control, and to eventually help the police take them out. Um, but let's remember, let's just remember, the ships are a part of it. I think the more important part is that Canada has provided about $50 million of direct assistance for training and equipment to the police over the past two years, uh, precisely to help the Haitians or that part of the Haitian solution uh, actually uh, stand up. Uh, it's provided up uh, armored personnel carriers. It's providing intelligence, in fact, uh, we have advisors uh, on the ground already. So, in fact, we already have boots on the ground, but without putting a kind of massive international military force on the ground that has been unsuccessful, as Mr. Decadi said, yeah. uh, in the past, uh, and that would be inappropriate given Haiti's problems. Let me just end by saying that the security assistance itself is only part of the much broader spectrum of uh, measures being deployed on the aid side, as you said, but also on the political side to contribute to a negotiated solution, the uh, transitional process that, uh, uh, that Madame Kleska uh, rightly pointed to as being indispensable. Kim Ives, uh, it looks like Haitian police are overwhelmed uh, right now by the security situation in the country. We have kidnappings, we have murders, they're at an all-time high. Uh, this past week, the chief of protocol uh, at the palace and his driver were kidnapped and 
large numbers of police have been killed as well. Let's listen to some of uh, what Helen Lalim said. Uh, let's listen to her again. The third element that will reinforce both the HNP and these developments is the deployment of an international specialized force as requested by the government last October. This has yet to materialize. The reality is that without this international deployment, operating in an integrated way with the HNP, the very positive effects of the political process and the sanctions so far will remain fragile and vulnerable to being reversed. Haitians overwhelmingly want this assistance so they can go about their daily lives in peace. So, Kim, what is your assessment of the current situation in Haiti? And is the deployment of an international force going to, uh, going to solve it? No, not at all. In fact, um, <laughs> that's, the, that's where the problem started. This problem dates back really three decades to 1991, when a uh, popular leader was elected, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and the U.S. and its allies in Haiti, who many of whom are part of the uh, government and even the opposition today, uh, basically overthrew him and then intervened to uh, cement that in place. And that happened not once but twice, again in 2004, after the <clears throat> 2004 coup d'etat. Now, both of those have so debilitated the states, made uh, the, the, the state in Haiti and made the police superfluous that they're very weak now and, and they've lost control of the situation. And fundamentally, the police, <laughs> it's not through guns that you're going to bring security to the country. It's not how big your weapons are. It's how linked you are to the people. You look at Cuba right across the Windward Passage from Haiti. They don't have police in these huge vehicles with antennas sticking off them and giant guns. No, they're linked to the people. The people support them. The people are with them. That's the way it is in the Haitian countryside, for example. Uh, the cities, it becomes more apparent because this is a rootless population. These are people who have been driven off their land by the very same neo-colonial policies of the three neo-colonial masters of Haiti, Canada. France and the U.S., and they're the ones now coming to say, we're going to save you. It's the wolves guarding the chicken house, and, you know, this is the cycle that has to stop. So Haitians are not, as Lalim said, and as I pushed back against her in the Security Council on December 21st, they are not overwhelmingly in support of foreign intervention in Haiti. They're overwhelmingly against it, and it right. should not happen. And Kim, uh, if, as you say, a starting point would be to engage with the population, um, to link with the people, as you put it, where does that start? How does that start, especially when you have an environment that is so dangerous? Well, that starts by listening to the people's demands and putting in place a government uh, in some way that reflects the interests of the people. This has been done in the past throughout human history, either by... Uh, elections, or sometimes by revolutions, as it happened in China or Cuba or Russia. So we see the possibility of one route or another. The U.S. in particular is desperate to keep control of this situation. They've, they've passed a, a, a law called the Global Fragility Act. Haiti is the test case. They want to put U.S. troops in Haiti with humanitarian USAID bags on their shoulders as camouflage to control the situation and to basically set up a military base for 10 years. That's the contract. To do so, they need to have an elected government in place. That's what they're hoping to get in some way or another with some group or another. And um, so right now, Haitians are in a, in a real battle for their sovereignty. Stephen, um 
Alexander Marcou of Médecins Sans Frontières in Haiti, he spoke with the new humanitarian, and this is what he had to say. I'll read it to you. He said, life is very hard now with gang violence and women being raped, and too many people are dying. There's no school, no hospital. We don't even have water to shower or to drink. Um, why have we not seen more aid getting to Haiti? And what do you make of what Kim told us a moment ago, that the U.S. goal here is to deploy a force under the guise of USAID workers onto Haiti and basically establish a base there? Well, two very different questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the aid, uh, there is a lot of aid going into Haiti, uh, but it isn't getting to uh, some of the people who need it most, partly because uh, the gangs control mm -hmm. uh, not only strategic parts, large parts of the capital, Port-au-Prince, but also uh, roads leading uh, from uh, Port-au-Prince south to Les Cailles and north to Gonaïve. Uh, so it is, in fact, very hard to resupply hospitals, schools, and to provide humanitarian assistance to, you know, the uh, gangs that have been cap the neighborhoods that have been captured by gangs and and other other some other parts of the country. The U.S. Look. Um, this is, we don't have time to have a full discussion about the, the, uh, the very problematic legacy of U.S. policy and practice towards Haiti and in the region. But I would say that nuance is required, um, that, uh, you know, to put the U.S., uh, uh, the U.N. and Canada in one bag, I know that uh, my colleague put France as the third, uh, the, the third, uh, the third uh, part of that uh, that triad in the back. but uh, France is not very active in Haiti on these issues today. The UN is much more central, uh, and the fact is they have debates. They right. have differences. They have different major differences over the end game uh, and over how to get there. And uh, Canada has been quite clear. Like I'm not a defender of the Canadian government on all issues, yeah. but I think on this issue. Uh, one has to recognize that over the past year, its position has changed. Right. Um, the U.S. wanted it to lead uh, as an intervention force in October. The Canadian government said, no, let's not repeat errors made in the past. Uh, the U.S. again pressured, as the U.N. has in the past few weeks. Canada went to CARICOM in part uh, to see if uh, there might be another way. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, not to put another failed interven military intervention in place. Okay. Um, so those are important. Those differences actually create space for the kind of negotiated transitional process that Madame Kleska uh, envisaged. Yeah, okay. Envis Mo yeah, Monique, you were talking to us earlier about the Montana group. Uh, can you tell us what the group does, what it's proposing, and how it, how it will help uh, in the formation of a new government? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the Montana group or the Montana movement uh, started about two years ago when civil society, different institutions in civil society, whether it is a, the church, a, the voodoo a sector, uh -huh. a trade unions, cultural groups, a human rights groups, feminist organizations got together, and the civil society uh, put together that commission and said, listen, try to find a solution to the crisis, because the politicians mm -hmm. were not reaching a solution. Because this is, this is a long, simmering crisis. Mm -hmm. But the political part of it really started with the uh, riots of July 2018, yeah. when youth took to the street and said, we want social services. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to go to school. We want health. We want jobs. So the commission got together in March 2021 right. and started meeting with different sectors. And from the meetings with civil society and meetings with all political parties, mm -hmm. it came up with a roadmap. Yep. And the roadmap that it presented is what is called commonly the Montana Accord. Yep. And the roadmap has a social service a part to it, a social justice okay. part to it, and it also has a governance part to it, where you must change the governance system of Haiti because it is corrupt 
yeah. because it steals the population, yeah. because it gets together, okay. and it has also put its hands on the police. Yeah. As Monsieur Decadzi had said, yeah. that the police was instrumentalized. Yeah. So uh, just a data set. Haiti has about 11.5 million people, yeah. and about one-third of that population lives in the Port-au-Prince area. So when Port-au-Prince has a problem, then it affects the whole country. Right, Even if in the boon side, yeah. it is people are going about their business, etc. All right, Monique, so I, the I, need, I, need, I need to move on. A Haitian solution, yeah. a Haitian-led solution, a transition of two years that we propose, and within okay. those two years, Monique, I need I need to move on. I've just got I've just got two minutes left, and I want to get to Albert. Albert, uh, earlier this month, the Haitian Prime Minister uh, appointed a transitional council to start a process towards a general election. Is this realistic? I mean, can you get a, have a general election in Haiti under these conditions? I'd be grateful if you could keep it brief because I want to get to Kim as well. Um, I, I'm hopeful that it, it, it could. We actually did propose something like that after the death of the president to stay within, at least stay within the, the Constitution to actually uh, quickly go to election. And we, we did propose a sage group, which could be, but we did, we did uh, wanted to not see politicians yeah. head of the, uh, of these movements. We wanted to see more people of a, of a sage type or, or, or from the uh, civil society. Kim, uh, just one final point uh, I want to ask you about, and that is there was an opinion piece in Geopolitical Monitor written by George Monastiriakos, and he said, Haiti has become a failed state and serves as a transit point for drugs imported from Latin America to the U.S. and for guns to be exported from the United States to Latin America. What do you make of that statement? Is Haiti a failed uh, state? Uh, yeah, it's baloney. Haiti is not a failed state. Uh, Haiti is a state which is challenged, which is, uh, has been oppressed and exploited for its entire history. Uh, and I think that uh, it is seeking to find its liberation. Uh, I think that uh, the Haitian people are capable of it. They were the first independent nation of Latin America, uh, the first black republic. So I think that the um, uh, failed state uh, uh, verbiage usually is some sort of justification for uh, this is for the U.S. or its allies to intervene in a country. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching. of business is to bring value.